Hey, hey, John, thank you for coming back to the show. Um, we left off with uh, a cliffhanger and a lot has happened since then. For This is our part four yes. uh, of this series of what's been going on. Yes. And uh, I just want to remind the audience, and I'll be run- reminding them multiple times throughout the, the show, that in the, in the description section of this video and all the videos that I have with John, there are links to his website. And you click that link and you'll be able to purchase his periodical. Um, you can set up for a reading. Um, he has a ton of information to share. So please click the link and support John's, uh, John's work. He also has more than 50 books and he's constantly writing. So uh, go, and, go and, and purchase those books. But please, in the description of this video, click the link and uh you know help john out and i'll be premiering this multiple times on youtube so far the last two shows i've been able to keep up on youtube so that's a good thing um and uh of course the audience knows to also see your content that i've done with you on rumble bitchute and brighton so john thank you for coming to the show again this is part Thanks. four and uh, the cliffhanger was December first, twenty twenty three. Yeah, why don't you? Why don't you? You actually, I think it'd be good for you to introduce that again to the audience at large to uh-huh. kind of set it up because we ended the show last time two weeks ago talking about you had some premonitions or issues mm-hmm. some related to uh, mm-hmm. perhaps Hebrew or Israeli prophecy and all that. Uh, run that through, and then I'll start. Okay. Okay. So for the audience that, that doesn't know, for, for, from about August 1st, I've had this feeling from August 1st, all the way through November 30th of this year, where there's been kind of this dark cloud over not just my life, but other people that I know tangentially that I call the sensitives. Okay. That, are, that can sense something that's going on. And that uh, in September was when our, in the Jewish faith, near the end of September, where Rosh Hashanah starts and then it launches into Yom Kippur. And then after that, there's Sukkot. And then after that, there's Simkas Torah. And that happens to end in Israel uh, on October 7th. Outside of Israel, it actually is October 8th. Um, there's two day holiday outside of Israel. Well, it's a one day holiday in Israel. So the, the attack happens on October 7th. Uh, it so happens that on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, we couldn't blow the shofar because it was the Sabbath and you're not supposed to blow the shofar, but the shofar silences the great prosecutor or people, Satan is how we pronounce it, but people would say Satan. Um, and, uh, when you don't do that, there is, uh, the potentiality, a high potentiality of that year, at least starting poorly for the Jewish people. All right. Maybe even the whole year, you know, but at least it, at the very least it, it's, it's, it's a bumpy start. And, and, and may I just interject for non-Jewish people that the year being the Jewish year, which starts, uh, in October, right? Well, it, it's on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh it's on Rosh Hashanah, yeah. and it changed. It changed because it's on a lunar cycle. Right. Sometimes it's in September. September. Sometimes it's in, in October. In this case, Rosh Hashanah was actually in September. Okay. Right. But Simchas Torah in, it happens on October seventh. Right. Okay. So this holiday season runs from the end of September all the way into the beginning of October. So early autumn. 2023 to early autumn 2024 for the solar calendar just so people who are not knowing that know right so from there this year this year right right getting to a bad start right so okay so so this this big event in you know that happened in the middle east on october 7th in, in the middle of this dark feeling that i've been telling people to you know watch out and there's something happening on a le- that i felt that there was an an ending that's taking place on 11 30 
and a beginning of a dark cloud that is that is going past the sensitives and onto the wider world. All right, and that 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 happens on September uh, on uh, December first. Okay, so we just that just happened. It just so happens that this year, this December first is the um it coincides with the 19th of kislev kislev was when the altar ribby starts his cycle for the tanya and the tanya this is a hasidic very very holy person all right published his work in 1796 so this really deep hasidic safer book all right um uh reach the wider audience but the the jewels of the book go all the way back to the three pillars that were brought down at, at mount sinai and the three pillars was kabbalah mm -hmm. the oral torah and the written torah mm -hmm. now most people understand okay the written torah that's the scrolls that every you know people you know might have seen the oral torah was oral until the destruction of the temple and then it was codified right and that's the that's the mishnah and then expounded in the talmud and then the kabbalah which is kind of the mysticism on you know all the kind of the esoteric aspects of of judaism and and this and the thing is is that other religions have elements of kabbalah in it um Christianity has some Kabbalah in it. Um, obviously, Judaism, uh, the Quran has it. So there's a there's like a center core of that religion comes from, and that is this Kabbalistic essence or, or core. All right. So the the Tanya is coming from that that Kabbalistic core and trying to digest it in in pieces for people to understand it so you can view it as like almost the universe can be tapped into through like machine language and that machine language is kabbalah but it's like it's really hard to really understand it versus um like uh, object-oriented programming would be easier to understand versus machine machine language which is just ones and zeros. Well, if you could read just the ones and zeros, you would understand what it's doing, but it's hard for an individual to understand it. So, so you can you can manipulate letters, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet in certain ways with certain permutations and you actually create things, all right? That's the whole, that's the, uh, that, that's the mystic, mysticism of, of Kabbalah. So this Tanya book, is released in 1796 and the Alter Ribbies, the, the, the 19th of Kislev is a really important date of the, this knowledge coming to the wider audience. Okay. There, this, this Kabbalistic text, they were for only an elite group hmm. and it stayed an elite group. And there was actually infighting within the Hasidic movement. Why are you publishing something that should stay secret? And the idea is, is that, you know, he, the Alter Ribi basically said, mankind needs this because they've, they're drifting away. They need this to get back to the, to the source and be better people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, all right. So that's the 19th of Kislev Hebrew date, which happens to coincide with this, uh, this December 1st. Okay. Now everything is kind of relayed. People would say, well, it's slightly off out of alignment but you got to remember he, the hebrew date starts sundown of a day uh, the the day starts not at sunrise it's sunset and so that's where that's where maybe some people that are more focused on the solar can calendar say well th it seems like it's not aligned right but it's because of the setting the setting of the of the the start of the new day is really sunset, not sunrise. So 17th, the, the 19th of Kislev is a really, really important day. So 
you know, and I just, other sensitives have been saying s- stuff like October 24th is a, an important date. I don't know why, but, you know, but I, I didn't sense that. But the thing is, is that I had this feeling that August 1st, all the way to 1130 was going to be tumultuous for the sensitives and that we needed to prepare, meaning the sensitives to get the influx of something that was coming in this, in this, in December on December 1st is the, this influx of energy or this flux or of something. Okay. Then I find out about two weeks in, into the end of this 1130 cycle about the 19th of Kislev and the Alter Ribi in this text about Tanya. Okay. From there, then I, then I've had these thoughts that the sensitives are to be preparing themselves for this in this, this flux of energy and that each of us, I'm going to be kind of poetic here. Hopefully you'll appreciate it. You you know, people um, know about a menorah and there's, there's, you know, people light this on Hanukkah, right? Well, there was a menorah in the temple, right? This was like, and in the synagogues, you're supposed to have, um, especially the Orthodox synagogues, you'll have uh, an oil lighting there of, of some lights. I don't know if it's, I think it's five lights or six lights. I, I can't remember. But well, the that menorah should is eight, be, isn't it? Isn't menorah yeah, eight? Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, yeah okay. but that, that, right. No, you're right about that because the extra oil and created an extra, you know, you're right about that. So, but the menorah in the temple was seven. Okay. Now, but in the shul, I've seen five or six light, the, the lights. And I don't know if there's a reason why that is. I, I don't know the, the details and why that is. I think the shul that I go to, I think it's five, actually. Mm-hmm. And it's an Orthodox shul. So, you know, it's, they're doing the right thing. So I, I don't know why the, the number difference, if maybe it doesn't even matter, you know, since the temple is destroyed. But the menorah in the temple, all right, had this regular lighting that took place every day okay and certain parts of the day my understanding is is that uh, one part of the service or the morning service it was like the first five and then the midday service it was the last two or three something like that it was four to three or five to two i don't remember and that might be the reason why they only have five lighting i'm not sure so, so, but there was a separation of when it wasn't the whole menorah at any given moment is my point. Mm. So there's kind of an internal menorah in us. Mm. And so this, and the whole idea is, is that if, how do I want to describe it? There is a light, an or, or ain't so, ain't so infinite, or meaning light, light of the infinite. All right. So you have the infinite, but we can't attach to the infinite. We mm-hmm. can only get pieces of the ore, the pieces of the light, because it's very radioactive the closer you get to Ain Sof. So or Ain Sof goes through constriction. Those constriction points, those constriction, that constriction mechanism is called Simpson. So the Simpson is these multiple constrictions that bring the light to a point where we can benefit from it Mm. because it's too using human terms too radioactive for us to be close to it Mm. all right now we have kind of an internal menorah in us in our soul that is lit by this symptom of the or in self that that is going to be kindled through this influx and what is interesting and i just found this out on space.com i believe it's it's lou dobbs from cnn that owns it um but uh on space.com they said that there was some sort of major coronal mass that that ejected out on november 29th or 28th and that it, it it was 
It was red. Um, it was a lot of red light in it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I well, it's interesting because red's not a red, I believe, is Ruben's tribe. Huh. All right. Ruben, so yeah. so um so you know, there's some weird stuff going on even with and <laughs> there's no way to have predicted a coronal mass that happened on you know, November 28th or 29th or whatever, when we were talking, let alone when I've been saying between August 1st to November 30th, there, there's going to be this, there's this, there's this, we're, we're, we're moving into a different era. Mm. And that people that were the bellwethers, the sensitives were the ones that are, that, um, you know, these, during that time period, it was pretty tumultuous. I knew people that lost their teeth. I've known people that passed away during this time period or, you know, had, you know, had difficulty, difficulties financially or health issues or whatever. Right. So the, the sensitives, it wasn't a positive thing that was going on, mm. but they, but the thing is, is that it, this, it, it almost, this, this thing that was going on with them, it, it helped to, if they, had a good soul because not all sensitives are good there's some sensitives are uh, a little bit more nefarious or a little bit on the more on the evil side or judgmental side but if they Hitler was a sensitive <laughs> right right well yeah no you know, a channel he was, he was definitely a major right, channel right right, right 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 so but you see my point here so yes. so 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 individuals can prepare themselves for this influx of energy or knowledge after going through a tumultuous period in their life between August 1st to November 30th. Okay. So now what, what it means for the rest of the world and a subset, the sensitives going beyond December 1st, my understanding is, is that the, the sensitives now that have prepared themselves are capturing this flux of energy or knowledge trying to kindle their internal menorah. Now, it so happens that Hanukkah, sometimes it's at the end of the year, the solar year, sometimes it's early. This year it's early and it starts on the, on the 7th. So December 7th. So this is moving us. And I said that Kislev is a real, Kabbalistically Kislev because of the Alter Ribi is a really important Kabbalistic month. We're, we're moving into the end of the month of Kislev and it Hanukkah straddles both months Kislev the tail end of Kislev and I've, I don't I don't remember the Hebrew the name of the Hebrew month for the next month I'd have to look it up but it's straddling it right into the beginning of the next month so you're lighting the internal menorah and you're moving into the next month to try to gain this not this knowledge and this very holy Kabbalistic month of Kislev it starts to set it, it, right so and there's when, this and is, when does it set um I believe it's 29 days so the 19th right. we're already right. the 20th we're yeah the 20th so we have uh nine days left okay eight or nine days left that's right so the full moon is coming up that uh at, uh, let me just see briefly here. Um, yes, it's on the 26th. It's on Boxer Day. The full moon. Yeah. So, so here's, here's the, the, here, you know, so that's what's happening with the sensitives. Now what's happening with the non-sensitives and the rest of the world at large is there's this dark cloud. It's not a dark cloud. That's super thick all at once, but over time it gets darker and darker and in the news, I sense that th we're marching towards global conflict, global financial problems and that, that will really rock the foundation of, of the, the, the pillars of, of security that people thought they had in Western society. You yes. know, they think that their health and their wealth and all in their and their military prowess and all this is, you know, these these pillars of support. And they're to use a term that you, that is in 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 the Bible and in, in prayer books, 
you know, the mountains that melt like wax, mm. you know, something similar mm. is, is uh, the probability of it seems to be the melting of here. structures, the melting yeah. of rocks, yeah. solid yeah. mountains of dogma, the melting of yeah. economic yeah. givens, the, the melting yeah. of, I mean, I think from this, there's a lot of, to unpack and um, that I think that kind of, I feel like ready. I can now respond to it. Um, yes, the between August and the turn of this month, um, some pretty significant things are unraveling. Uh, that that is an end of one thing, a creation of something new. The Ukrainian war is about to collapse. Uh, it's maybe within days, weeks. The uh, so that is one situation. Um, the other situation is that um, it was very significant that the 30th was the day before, let's see, I believe the 30th was the day, was it a Friday, the 30th? The Friday was the, the uh, let me double check, I think so, hold on. Yeah, I think it was. No, 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 the 30th was Thursday. Okay. But you gotta, well, you know, yeah, yeah. There's Thursday solar what, calendar deal. You know, it's it's yeah. it's a Thursday. What what happened? Let me just check my chart here because it's easier to see. I'll just be off camera for a moment just to look at this. Um, the today, okay, there it is. All right, yeah, the twenty fourth. Uh, that's very interesting. The twenty fourth had some interesting stuff happening. That is when this, I think the ceasefire began. It lasted, it was extended. The ceasefire in Gaza was extended to seven days. So, so the ceasefire officially ended. Um, I think we've been through the, the first and second days past it. And it, it's rather, it's rather significant that The, the Zionist government of Netanyahu had had bedded their integrity, their their credibility. Of, we will never have a pause. We will never have a ceasefire. And I mean, over our dead bodies, will there be a ceasefire? But there was also, and there's growing more and more the pressure all over the world is in a world where we actually are seeing acts of genocide before our eyes um, especially if you go on x which is not censored and filtered you get to see it all and other sources of mine and so i'm going to start in loose ends and come to the center of this because what we're dealing with is people who presume a perception of leadership who do not have it. People who have an idea that their mountain of Zionism cannot be melted. A, a Israeli prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu, who had, um, and his cabinet had reacted to the initial October 7th raid of Hamas with such overreaction, invoking the Hannibal solution, where the, the thing that was the cause of this trigger of all this pent up, almost racist hatred for Palestinians, even to the highest levels of government, uh, beginning to quote, Samuel, book of Samuel, chapter 15, when Samuel was saying that this is the same thing as the Amalekites. I mean, there's Bibi Netanyahu quoting in his speeches in Hebrew, uh, the statements of Samuel speaking for the Lord of hosts on what you do to eradicate, kill all the people, the men, the women, the babies in their arms. Uh, and then or reduce them all, including their livestock, and uh, a complete wipeout, a, a genocidal act. Now we can debate the the ethics of this or not, but the point is that here is this man, 
Netanyahu, spouting this to the world, the whole world seeing him going biblical, going think Amalek, which was his threat to Iran many years ago, which we talked about in earlier shows because of a mistranslation when Ahmadinejad, the president, had made a statement that was translated wrong because they don't have a word for it. He was talking about how the political map that Israel would be, well, the one state solution, basically. But he, so he said Israel would no longer be a political reality. He did not say wipe it off the map. But that's what the Iranian translators equated it in English. And of course, Netanyahu just took off and ran with it. Um, his, and now it's clear because of what happened on October 7th and 8th that uh, he was behind his offices sending that message, think Amalek, Iranians, because here he is quoting it. So it came directly from him as I had intuited many years ago. I said, no, this is from, he's trying to hide behind his office, the presidential office, but it's from him. So it came out. Came, so important thing, things come out. Things that are suppressed are revealed. Things, um, and so, but all of this that has led to, you know, I would say we are approaching 30,000 dead Palestinian civilians. Another thousand died in the first day. It was 109, and it got up to 1,000 in the second day. The um, the um, communist attack may have taken out 1,000 civilians in all those new buildings that were built by Qatar. Uh, and I watched it. It was terrible. It was all these gravity bombs coming in, U.S. built. You know, there's a big pressure for the United States because the whole world is saying your bombs, it's as Israel's shooting them, but they're your bombs. And there is, a, if 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 your listeners and watchers watch a lot of the mainstream press, it's even getting hard for them to completely put a lid on that. That it, it just as it's getting hard for them to put a, 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 a to put a lipstick on the pig that is the loss in Ukraine big loss for NATO. So these things are coming to a head. And the thing that is that dawned on me that the, the, the thing that triggered this genocidal fever of the leadership of Israel to once and for all eradicate the problem. I mean, all, all the, about a million Palestinians were forcibly forced to move under fire to the safe zone, which is southern uh, Gaza. And now they're bound, bombing and pounding southern Gaza like they were doing northern Gaza. And people are dying. Um, the, and, and Amalek is invoked. But what triggered this, this outrage and this all this pent up hate that has been there um, about greater Israel and how we, you know we've talked about in earlier shows that you know the seed I look at it again the seed all the seed of Abraham is the same seed whether it's coming from Hagar or the serving woman of Sarah or Sarah herself and I kept reading and reading it after our show to make sure I was seeing that right and it does not in the first. And I clarified, I'm currently a few days away from producing my next Hope Prophecy Report, which is going to further go into this, that the, you know, the promised land prophecies in, in um, I think it's in those, those the first three messages of, of the Lord of hosts to Abraham are, I think, I think more important than all the others that came after because they're the foundation of it, because they were given before Isaac was born. So it was given to Ishmael, who would have been the first Semite, you know, uh, in, in this group. I, Isaac was not born yet. So it changes. It, it's, it's just like this. If When I look at UFO reports, I tend, or when I look at the Hopi prophecies, things that have become popularized, um, and when I wrote, wrote my highly popular little book, the, the Essential Hopi Prophecies, which is available on Amazon, um, is I made sure that I only wrote about what the Hopi elders said back in the 40s and what the, the couple 
white messengers that the good Pahana uh, also said at the beginning. Because what has happened since then is it's it, when it's gone viral now, it's just like what's happened in the field of Nostradamus, which I'm a long party of, of is, is that now everybody's an expert. And most people don't do, they just embellish their, they don't know how to critically think, they don't know how to research, they just make shit up. And and it becomes more myth and more myth. And so in a lesser sense, the things that are stated later to clarify the initial statements, I think uh, are not, I cannot, my sense, my light, inner light of that stream of light, my menorah says that, that uh, that the first three statements the Lord of Hosts gave to um, Abraham make it very before both children Isaac and Ishmael. I, Ishmael was alive and older. I, I don't know how many years older, but he was definitely out, and Isaac was still a dream when he said, "All the seed of Abraham." He meant what has been mistaken as Eretz Israel, greater Israel. That's what the Zionists call it. But it's not that. It's all the seed of Abraham. The seed is not changed by which womb it sprouts in. It's still the seed of Abraham. That's the argument I make in my new articles. That, uh, you know, it, it, to get all caught up in the ventris, the vessel of how it comes out, is... To me, the way I interpret it is that he meant all of these lands listed are the lands of the Semitic people, my chosen people, which happen to be sprouting from Ishmael and from Isaac. So this whole thing of this struggle between who's, well, Ishmael can't be right because he's he came out of a serving girl, somebody of a lower class than Sarah. So there's where all the, class politics start coming into it so 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 here you have a situation where what triggered all of this rather racist explosion this catharsis of hatred for the palestinians and if, let's have a final solution for them not even thinking how that parallels so what happened back in the 40s but they're blinded by anger and rage and netanyahu is losing it unhinged but the truth is that what triggered him and all and and Yov Galant to say they're all animals, those Palestinians, we cut off their water, we cut off their food, we cut off their fuel. I mean, these are brazen acts of collective punishments, of war crime. And he was saying they're all animals. So all that ugliness that's always been repressed, and that's what comes up in these kind of big, that's what that darkness is. We're in a time where things are getting exposed to the air by events. Things that, that have been followed, like, you know, this encroachment for decades of NATO lying through their teeth, saying they're never intending to encroach and threaten Russia. Russia saying, please stop. If you go to the borders of Ukraine and Georgia, you're, we will have to go to war with you. You're, if you keep advancing right up to our borders like Napoleon, like Hitler, like Charles XII of Sweden, it's going to be war. We don't want that. Let's talk. Well, NATO wasn't listening. Now we have war. And now NATO is losing the war. Ukraine is about to collapse. And I, it could collapse before the end of the year. That's how it's, it's when, when attrition wars break, it is sudden. It's like, oof. and, and then, uh, so, and Russia has built its army now to 2.2 million with 1.3 million, not in reserve, but active. So now, they're um they're they're and why such a big army with all the tanks and stuff because they are seeing the potential that nato wants to directly go to war with them so and america so they are ready just in case hopefully it won't happen but they're ready so 
so it's it's always been for the Russians bigger than mere Ukraine. Ukraine is just the the whipping boy. Ukraine is the proxy. Similarly, Hezbollah plays proxy in this theater of operation. But we'll get back to that. Um, this the twelve hundred. Israeli citizens that were killed in the first day, the highest number of Israeli citizens of Jewish descent killed in any day of any battle of any war since 1948. The shock that was heard in outrage across Israel and the world is based on a friendly fire event of Israeli forces blowing up helicopters coming in and shooting down and blowing up masses of people they saw running around whom the Israeli IDF command did not tell these these poor boys coming in with their helicopters to shoot anything that moves uh, because of this breakout they thought these are all these people were running around with the with the um with the Hamas people they're trying to escape us uh, that have come out they're, they said that they must have they're all the people that are coming out uh you know it's the return no it's all that they thought they were all palestinians flooding into israel with hamas people in them as making them human sh shields and they were shooting them all but they were the people in the um the rave the nova rave that was a peace uh, rave, you know, so it's like a 24 hour dance. And then that dawn, when it was ending, the, the breakout, suddenly the Hamas people are running into these people and they, they didn't even know who they were. What's this going on? So, but it was long story short, of the 1,200 people that were killed on that first day, Israelis, over 80% of them were killed by Israelis. And in my, I have many links to the videos and, and a lot of this to, to make this argument. So what I would be saying to Netanyahu, if I could hold his hand and calm him down is say, look, you've invoked Samuel and a solution to the Palestinians equivalent to the Amalekites. That's pretty hard, terrible thing you've just declared and it's based on your wrong-headed thinking about what happened most of those jews were killed by jews in helicopters who were not told by the command of the idf about the rave they didn't know about it so much for this vaunted if ever there's something we can learn from this one of the thing is is that the israelis decided to ignore human intelligence and rely mostly on artificial intelligence to monitor and guide and decide what's a threat or not we talked about that earlier that Hamas had figured out that they were going mechanical and there now is even more Haaretz and others have posted more uh reports about the financial times as well about how mostly women IDF soldiers were the guards observing and monitoring the 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 the, uh, the prison wall, and they had been over a week or so before this all happened. They were constantly saying, "Look, there's something happening." So they were going to their main uh, main intelligence officer, calling him, saying, "Look, there's something. They're going to do something," and. Um, the uh, they absolutely and one of them said if we were men reporting this they would have listened to us but because we were women they didn't listen to us and you know some of those israeli women soldiers survived what happened and now you know the 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 pucky is going to hit the fan about that so that's another element about these things where we have now entered so this whole war, this whole, we're not going to listen to anybody. We're going to go all the way. We don't care what the world thinks. It's our, it's, it's us against the world, um, which is, that's what that says. And we're over our dead bodies. Will we make America pressure us to do a, um, a ceasefire? They call it a pause, but uh, folks, it's a ceasefire. And uh, they did it. 
So um, that, morally speaking, could be the beginning of the end of this whole terrible conflict. Although I must warn you that it's, it's in the field of prophecy, people like me point to the moment when things really turned, but that that can be misconstrued to mean, oh, it's all going to calm down, everything's fine. No, it could the the very the very fact that Netanyahu has lost, whether he doesn't consciously know this, that the fact that they buckled and they had a ceasefire means there's going to be more ceasefires, and so what's we're in a pattern now where horrendous destruction and genocide is going to happen the world's going to get more pissed off and the pressure will be forcing israel again the zionist government again to give more pauses because the one thing the people uh, of israel and i mean a lot of people in israel are not happy with this government and what they're doing um, i gotta make for uh, make this point it is wrong to identify zionism as judaism i would contend that the majority of jews in the world are not zionists the 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 whole zionist concept as i explain with their own quotes that we've painfully had to listen me read is that zionism is a kind of fascism and not only did I say that, but as I, sh in earlier shows in 1948, I presented the, the letter from Einstein and other Jewish Zionist thinkers who were thinking of Zionism as let's have a homeland. But then they were afraid of the other Zionists who would say, let's make this apartheid fascist state where we are the chosen, not only the chosen people, but the master race of God. And then we have Yabolinsky, Yabotinsky, the, the father of the right wing, the coup kind of feeling about this, which is in power now uh, with Netanyahu and even more extreme people in his coalition than Likud could even dream of being. The, the, the problem has been that the, there's, there's there there was this quote that I said last time, and I'm actually co condensing them in this new article that where the Yabotinsky actually says there's a law that exists more than God, more than the holy. He said, you know, the land. And again, he was literally letting the cat out of the bag, which was what a lot of people were pointing to him and the other Likud, Magat, and Menach and Begin and all is what makes Zionism uh, anti judaic in a way is that it is it is politicized. It's it's a bunch of people who are basically atheists who are hiding behind the idea of the chosen promised land as a political means to gain more power and expansion and take out the lesser semite races so it's it's trying to be a wannabe aryan just like hitler was trying to be a wannabe chosen of god and it's the same sick mindset it's in it was in the germans it's in the ukrainians uh, which is a Nazi regime. And now, because there's a coup about to happen in Ukraine, um, Zeluzhny, the general, is kind of being set up to be the next president. And if he is the next president, then the mask comes off because his chief advisor is Nazi Ukrainian number one, Dmitro Yarosh, the founder and creator of Pratli sector, right sector, those those red and black flags that you see in Ukraine, that is the ultimate fascist Ukrainian movement. They are responsible with the help of Victoria Newland and the State Department of Barack Obama. And to this day, his vice president, now President Biden, um, in a fascist takeover that 
take, took over the uh, Yanukovych elected government of Ukraine and replaced it and changed the system of government to so that every president since um, Poroshenko being one, they won't let him out of Ukraine. He got stopped at the border. He's trying to get out. And Zelensky. These are the two presidents that have happened after the uh, transitional government. But what they did in the Rada is they set it up under fascist rules. They banned all the other parties, just like Hitler did. They um, they banned all opposition newspapers. Uh, and I mean, Ukraine is exactly like Nazi Germany. When people talk about how it's defending democracy, my God, how how far reality has fallen. Um, you, the, he, it is exactly a return of Nazi Germany. And unfortunately, this is the period I've all, most of my prophetic life in this life, I've been saying the 2020s, watch out. Fascism will return. The cycle of its return is here. I started saying it would come as a, a different mean. It would be like a globalist aristocracy of elite wealthy people who want to make a global society. It would, uh, it would sometimes find itself uh, overtaking countries that have a, a very passionate religious basis to them like Israel, like Iran, maybe, you know, the, the, you know, ISIS is a, is kind of a version of Wahhabist fascism, Islamic fascism. And that has come and been kind of suppressed for now. Now it's rising up in Zionism in Israel. And, and so, you know, based on a, on a blunder and not fall and in an instant explosion of, of, of emotion, this government has moved pell-mell into a situation where it's now set itself up with if it can't do what it wants to do to the Palestinians, which it's always wanted to do to them, all the quotes going to the beginning of Zionism, back me up. Now they got their chance. Now's the time. Now or never. And, and there's a quality of now or never in this darkness, which is kind of at the point of being exposed in many things. I mean, it's going to be exposed very soon in the world economy. Through uh, the, the key is the derivatives markets, um, which have been, if I understand correct, I'm not a financial person, but I don't fly planes either. And I did Nostradamus. He foresaw them. <laughs> he doesn't know how to fly. Does that mean his prophecy doesn't work? Well, in a similar way, I, I don't understand the, 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 the mechanics of derivative markets and I've come to understand that most people don't. But it's basically um, playing a game with debt. And if you play the game right and kind of forecast trends, you make a profit off of money that's actually it's not it's not you make a profit off something that's a debt which is sounds very sick to me i know. and and so what happens is more and more you're there's more and more debt there's more and more chances for those people to derive some kind of profit from seeing where all that debt is going but the reality is it's non-existent so one day happens where suddenly trillions of dollars that you've been playing with one day disappears it's uh, one day it's there it's like a self-induced jubilee <laughs> it's just gone so uh it's going to happen in europe worse but it's coming here too so this is also interestingly enough because of november 30th a lot of things started rolling like like i you know the iran war is about to collapse and then we have this thing that might be the very end of the Israeli state, as we've known it. Uh, Israel has lost credibility in the world. And the more this lasts, the more they try to kill all these men, women, and children of a lesser Semitic race. Uh, because God told them. This is the end of Israel as we've known it. The modern, a lot of some of my sources are saying that they think Israel will not exist. 
after this. It, it will, I can tell you already that hundreds of thousands of people are, who are dual citizens of Israel are leaving. And that's another structural issue that people don't understand is that APAC, which is the lobbyists for Israel, have got a, a break where they don't have to sign up as foreign agents for a foreign country. So APAC has bought and sold most of the Congress, presidents of the United States. Jeffrey Epstein was, a, was an asset of Mossad, as was his lover, whose father was a, a major asset. And, you know, there, there was even when Jeffrey Epstein got off really easy on his first uh, trials in Florida for underage women and prostitution, all of that. Uh, he got off easy and the guy that was uh, trying to really stick him in jail forever, he said, what happened? He said, no, he's an Israeli asset. Can't do anything. And what is he an asset of? One of the things that Mossad, I mean, I've often said Mossad is great at collecting data, but they, I, I'm not very impressed at how they uh, interpret their data because you know you have to you have to be a watcher of yourself and your own what you want to find in data. Data collecting is wonderful, but just I know this so well now in the world of Nostradamus that um, there's all this data, and and because these prophecies are nebulous, you can very easily find what you're looking for. It takes a real skill over many decades to learn not to do that. But you have to know yourself. If the agent doesn't know themselves, then it's very easy for a lot of great data to be misinterpreted, like those poor women discovered watching Hamas coming over the walls. Um, and, you know, or these poor people who israeli intelligence officers who literally said if you go above my head you'll be going to prison and so you know the, the the mindset of the intelligence officer can destroy the whole thing that's why the cia has been crap for 20 30 years they can't do anything right um, because they they're great analysts some of them read me for decades but uh, I can feel their pain because they're, they're getting it right. Nobody wants, no, no, make it nicer for the president. He'll, otherwise, he'll be upset. Don't tell him that. Well, isn't that my job? I'm, I have to be the bearer of bad news sometimes for the sake of the country. No, no, no. That's, that's where it started happening during the Reagan years. So, you know, a lot of the assets that I work with, I mean, I don't know them personally, but I, I cite them as sources. Maybe someday I'll meet Larry Johnson and, and people like Scott Ritter, who is a U.S. Marine intelligence officer, former and weapons inspector. Um, he, um, but you know, there's a pattern of what a lot of them are saying is that there was a it shifted in the 1980s, and uh, they were no longer there to be critical and be the devil's advocate. They were there to kiss up and make every president happy and not give them reality. And you can see from the 80s on how, I mean, we've we've been a mess in our foreign policy, but we've got away with it because where else can the world go to when the US dollar is the reserve currency? You just kind of kind of shine it on with the Americans and tolerate them because if you don't, they slam IMF on you and all that destroy your economy. And, and that's gone now. That's gone when the Saudis broke away from the petrodollar being solely a use. They started buying renminbi, Chinese, and have not, and now opened them up to any currency that wants to use them. So the U.S. dollar lost its its commodity that makes it of value, Saudi oil. And this is the most significant crack in the, 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 the meltdown of the mountain of dogmas, and this is how it is, and this is reality that has hit. I mean, I warned it 
while back this is it this this is now will be the rapid decline of the united states because now a whole different financial system is being built china and russia russia was forced to abandon the western economies by the sanctions and now they're doing great the chinese are rapidly selling off all their u.s bonds uh getting rid of all of them because they see this coming this thing with the derivatives coming and so this is a i would call it potentially the greatest depression something like what happened in germany in 1923 and 24 a century ago when there could be a great inflationary moment there they don't last long but they you know your cup of coffee costs a billion dollars um and uh, to you know, get to a point where it's just uh, obscene. You know, it's like uh, here's a, here's a suitcase full of money. Can I have my uh, my tea? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it doesn't last long. And uh, but the but it but we're in the centenary of that. We might actually repeat it. And um, so the United States cannot make money anymore and go and and spend beyond its means. And it's funny how. It's another big rock of reality that's coming down is that the the everybody thinks that the in military industrial complex, even a lot of my good sources are kind of not seeing this where, oh, they'll keep going, they'll keep doing, they'll try to expand in new wars. Well, yeah, of course they are. I mean, I mean, the one news that came out today was that um, the real reason it was uh, Lloyd Austin kind of let the cat out of the bag. As somebody said, he's a bit thick and but he's very upfront because he's not, not subtle enough not to let the cat out of the bag. But he pretty much stated something today, which shows that the the real motivation for this war with the Ukraine, with the Soviet, with the Russians, was to start a new Cold War so that uh, the military industrial complex could. Uh, we got an emergency here, and now now we got to build more shells, four times more than we do, and we got to modernize they're talking about how they're going to modernize the military industrial complex of the united states and it shows that it's time and here's let's invest and and you know and they're all thinking from a point of view is that uh the the total you know eight eight hundred plus billion if you add to that the the, uh, the security defenses the black operations and all that you're talking 1.3 trillion a year for secret operations and special forces operations, and then the Army, Navy, and the Marines, and all those 800 to 1,000 bases where the sun never sets on an American not-so-good weapon anymore, as this war has proved. But they're trying to spin that around as, oh, that's because we got to renew. You know, it's like, it's just like what happened in Pearl Harbor. We had to, you know, do something and get it bigger, and and because we're in this long-term conflict with China and Russia, you know, and and so it's to make a buck. But the problem is, in the next two years, the United States dollar, who it could, which could spend itself on deficit spending, because every it was because everybody was buying bonds. Not anymore. So what does that mean? I mean, even I can understand this. That uh, it was not an economist. That oh well, that that game that that shell game's over. And what does that mean? That means America uh, will inflate, and what was one point three trillion dollars will be the equivalent of five trillion dollars a year, maybe twenty trillion dollars, and you cannot afford it. So the military-industrial complex is going to also be one of those big rocks melting down. It cannot. It was. I always saw America's hegemony ending because the dollar. That could not bear the deficit spending anymore and then it's suddenly gone it, you can't even afford to give the, it'd be like what happened to russians and their bases around russia they they weren't being paid anymore they weren't getting any food and water you know they had to leave you know because it was the the ruble was dead you know and, and just collapsed and and the united states has got all these bases all over the world and if they cannot if they spend too much, it's inflationary and it blows the economy. If they spend too little, then these guys can't sustain themselves. So a whole lot of U.S. military assets are coming home to a junk heap. 
And so this military industrial fantasy of using this as a new Cold War, people still think that they can keep publishing worthless fiat money. No, it's it, we are going down like the Soviet Union went down in the next two years because of this. So that's a big thing happening. And I would say things have definitely seller, except, kind of built, built, built of darkness from August built built like big black clouds and now the thunder clouds are unleashing reality and air people are getting all uncomfortably wet in the flashing lightning of illuminating this dripping wet realities that we have thought were true which are not they're limp noodles and you know that got too much water in the rain um and so so now I'll give you an astrological dimension to this. Um, the this this Pluto is not just significant in its returns to the birth position it had two hundred and forty eight years ago in the birth of the United States, but because the United States is such a pivotal capstone to this whole mountain pyramid that's going this Ponzi pyramid scheme that's going to melt down it, it that's why uh this coming home to its birth point is a rebooting of not only just america but the whole global system that america has been the foundation of especially since the world war ii and primarily in its hegemonic period of the last 32 years so uh where we were the only thing in town so we could abuse it any which way we want. And now the bill is coming. And so, but what's good about it is that it's the whole world is not stuck to the dollar anymore. So China will continue to flourish. It, Russia will continue to flourish. India will continue the, the global South, which is Africa, South America, and and asia and all that they are now seeing a world where they're not under u.s dollar tyranny they're going to be doing business with each other and america can go go you know take a jump in the lake financially speaking so so the west is losing its hegemony over the world that it's had building since 500 years so it's like 500 years thing that's built this, this era of American, of, of European dominance of the world. And, you know, there was the largest in the 1840s, the largest economy in the world was China. And then the uh, British and the French came in with the opium wars and all, and they destroyed all that, broke it all up. But the largest per capita industry was China. In fact, that has been often the case throughout human history that uh, China has been the dynamo now it's so we're not this is some, not something new this is coming back to something that was the main flow of human development for millennium that is Eurasia being the center of things not the west so um and Russia being a borderline like Turkey, but really with its literally having two one foot in Asia and one foot in Europe. I mean, Europeans trying to reject Russia as a European member is cutting one third of the continent away from Europe. You just look at a map of Russia. One third of Europe is European Russia. And so it's another way for Europe to cut its own nose off to spite its face, which it's been doing a lot. So, so what's now happening? It's going to happen in Israel. It's going to happen in America. It's going to happen in Europe. It, it's going to be a lot of soul searching. I would call this the this, November 30th begins the great soul search of those who had been in power and domination of the world who are now losing it and rapidly it's going to be such a shock the danger is that a lot of unconscious people not so sensitive people as we're talking about will take that shock 
and try to take if if my world cannot exist i'd rather take it all down with me so that's the big danger here i said that the the fact that netanyahu's government lost morally lost already when they had to accept uh, a ceasefire which i said they never do well that just shows well okay you don't have the power to stop that you, 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 and then what eventually will happen, it will not have the power to kill all the Palestinians because it's a good sign in our, in our world. It wasn't there during the Holocaust last time, but in this current Holocaust of Semites, ironically, Jews killing Arab seed of Abraham, their cousin brothers and sisters, not the Aryans versus the seed of Abraham of the Jews the last time. So it's taken this next step of outrage and hypocrisy um but that so there's the vast majority of people who don't want to change and as the hopi prophecies say they're they would rather drop dead from their own fear of change than change um but there's also though in a minority their quantity of intelligence is far more in, bright as a light than all the darkness of people who just want to live like camels and machines and believe in all even if it's true or not they just believe rather than know they believe in god rather than know god they you know they and and so that all of that is coming to a head in this major we're we're now in I think 2024 is the first year of really um, age epoch ending, um, epoch beginning um, things. And we may not make it because we're not the only civilization that's had to place ourselves upon the lathe of truth and see kind of blasted away, ground away all the bunk of at least the last 500 years, if not the last 4 million years of human existence, because it's it's a death, it's also a rebirth. It's a travail, but it's also a rebirth. I mean, it's a theme I come back to a lot, but it is, um, Israel is now dying to be reborn. And it may, it may return to not having it be a, a place for instance i talk about this too in my new articles the third article is quite kind of wow when i finished it i said man that's like a transmission i that's interesting but you you will be the judges if any of you wish to um go to hogprophecy.com and see the samples are free and then join my for 60 dollars uh for, for a year or do an automatic payment of five dollars a month you'll be able to see these, these articles in their whole uh, content. Um, but the, the, um, I put out something that even I personally have a hard time agreeing to it, but the, the two state solution is dead. It, it it may be a now a transitional transaction after the pieces are picked up but i mean there's cer certain scenarios that if that if all this stuff that's going on outside of the main focus of the terrible things going on in gaza the whole world's watching the more important things not to forget is the the insurrections that are going on in iraq over american bases you know, the fact that American bases in Syria who are illegally there stealing all of Syria's oil since 2018 when the ISIS, they, they replaced ISIS. ISIS made finance. Ever wonder how this, the state, the Islamic state of ISIS, uh, was able to function as a nation? Because it did for a few years there. It did so by selling uh, Syrian oil. And through the Turkish contacts in the black market, and they were paid in hard U.S. paper cash. So the whole system was based on U.S. cash, and they just and it worked. They just they they they, they did the, the promissory notes. 
and the, it was based on the oil they were stealing, just like the oil of Saudi Arabia was based on the U.S. dollar. Their basis was also oil commodity. Pay, we only want U.S. dollars, and so the whole Islamic State was run that way. And of course, when Syria invited the Russians to come in legally as an old ally to help them with ISIS. The first thing the Russians did was something the Americans didn't do for a year. Their jets were casting shadows over huge columns of oil trucks going off from Syria into Turkey. And the West the American jets were ignoring them. First thing the Russian jets did is they bombed and strafed all those oil tankers, blew them up, big fires, ended the whole dollar so they, in a few days, pulled the plug on the Islamic State's ability to financially make its economy work. Okay, boom, you know. So, um, so America got involved, and 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 uh, and then America somehow managed to finagle itself into the, with the death of ISIS into occupying the oil fields in northeastern Syria, and because of that, the Syrians can't create enough capital to rebuild their ruined country that isis ruin and the islamic uh, um, civil war that happened is still on over 11 12 years now killed over 700,000 syrians displaced 10 10 to 20 million syrians inside the country and beyond and that has been the strategy of of the zionist state that uh, using america and Sometimes the dumb Americans even you lose a lot of their people in these wars. They fight for Israel, for APAC, who has bought the United States presidency and the House and the Senate. I mean, this is how they do it. They say, they come, look, we'll give you money for your election. But if you go against them, if you're critical of what Israel's doing, they come to you and say, well, you know what? We're not going to give you that money this year. We're going to, we found somebody who's pro Zionist who, run against you and they it's called we we're going to primary you so you end up if you don't surrender to the israelis as the money is supposed to give you then somebody will replace you in a new seat who will be a zionist sympathizer and so you know i mean one of the things should happen if we are going to take back our sovereignty as a country is um First off, let's make, be clear. One of the things that's going to be exposed about this is Israel has never been a sovereign country. It has required big, powerful, dumb backers like us, the United States, to effectively destroy Iraq and even lose 7,000 soldiers doing it to keep all the more powerful up-and-coming Arab nations uh, broken, bled out in chaos. That is the way, a very toxic way, rather than solving your problems with your fellow Semite brothers and sisters, but to, and again, has a racist overtone, which is finally out. The wound stinks. Thank God it's in the air at last. Let us smell it deep and see it for what it is so that the Israelis can be healed from their racism. It's an ancient racism, and it has come out it is not at all a coincidence to me that of two things that the the the, is, the Israelis of the Bible managed to completely wipe out the race of the Amalekites, a Holocaust, a successful Holocaust, wiped them out, nearly wiped out the Canaanites, nearly wiped out the Moabites. The, the ancient Hebrews were very good at stamping out uh, whole races in their way. And that's why they're such fast allies with the United States, because we got away with the American Indians. We got away with wiping out the cultures of Native Americans and not having to pay a price for it. So there's a certain, yeah, we get each other. We might not want to really look at that, that ugly side, but there it is. And it's a wound for both America and both Israel. It's not surprising that the people who were so successful in eradicating entire races proudly posted in the Bible 
ended up in a holocaust against a wannabe chosen one of God, Adolf Hitler, and his people. Wanted to be as exceptional as the chosen people of God, as exceptional as the United States, the exceptional nation. And what happens when you think you're exceptional and not just a human being like anybody else? You get away with murder, but it's okay. I'm exceptional. Who knows why God uses me as the instrument to wipe out the Amalekites? In fact, he says, we're going to use you Jews to do it, you know, and we're gonna, who knows that America, the great city on the hill, has to eradicate those evil savages and those backwards people. And, and, and we are exceptional, so we have a right to go into your household, whatever country you are, and tell you how you should live. And if you don't do what we say, we stop giving you funds and, and money and aid. Well, now no one cares about our dollar. So that whole game's over. It's over. So America, it's not just Israel's having a comeuppance, it's the other people who got away with genocides and things like the exceptional people, the Americans, they're going to, they're also going to have their, it, it, this is the age of after November 30th of the great comeuppance for a lot of things, you know, if a bully ever becomes wise, he has to be knocked on his ass. <laughs> just, it's like Alexander McCurris in the, of the Duran, he made this amazing statement, which is not as when he makes statements like that, it's really worth listening because he he's very not at ease to go there. So when he said, when Alexander Cristofaro, his partner, asked the question, well, where do you think all this is going with Ukraine and NATO? It's like everything they're trying to do. It, it's clearly failed, but they keep stepping into the doo-doo deeper and deeper. And he said, well, you know, he's kind of Greek, but he's born, raised in London. He says, well, might I say, I think what's going to happen is sometimes um, the only answer is that you've got to walk right in and get a bloody nose. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like what von Clausewitz, the great military analyst, uh, said is that all the great military plans um are turn into air when the first shot is fired or my favorite is the variation that mike tyson said a very interesting man if he, he, he <laughs> there's a lot going on there that the the stereotypes really should be put aside very interesting man anyway um he did a show where he just kind of said talked about his whole life and i went man this guy is a, this guy is a kind of a genius <laughs> A genius of the hard knocks. And, and he said, so anyway, Mike Tyson said, you know, everybody's got a plan how to fight, uh, how to win a fight until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> you know, so same, it's fun, Klaus, but it's a little more, uh, you know, it's a little more um, vulgar, uh, but, uh, you know, vulgar means in Latin, you know, the lowly people. You know, um, so, but I don't know, common sense of the people, people who don't have lace and frou-frou and, and, you know, I'm so special just because I say so. Um, those are idiots and fools, fluffy fools, <laughs> you know, down to earth folks, they have a wisdom you know, that doesn't have all that frou-frou. <laughs> so, so we, we are entering, it, it, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, the point, the targets are, of course, the capstones of our times, which would be America um, using Israel as a way to keep the Middle East down so they take the oil. That's all over. So, uh, so what happens is there's a lot of, it's a tremendous opportunity as you're all feeling, oh my God, what's going to happen next? I mean, what's the world going to be like when I wake up tomorrow? It's going to be all different. You know, it, yeah, a lot of fear, a lot of loathing, a lot of, God, what's going on? It's actually been building for the last decade, but 
is really coming to the head now in the 2020s as I predicted it would. And, and even in 2024 is also a year that I've said with 2023, 2024 was when, man, we really get to feel what the roaring 2020s were like. You know, uh, you know, the first was, that was 2020 was wild with COVID and 2021 also wild with the, what was wrong with the cure of covid and then and many other things i'm just picking one thread out of many but and then then you have um this war in ukraine it's literally put us into another kind of conventional world war situation and now we have the land of armageddon joining into it um and which is very key biblically and prophetically so when that started having said oh man now, now I gotta. Now my prophetic work has got time to end. Now I have to deal with all that stuff. So, so from Samuel to the Book of Revelation and all that, and the um, Joaquin de Fiore's uh, three great ages of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit stuff um, is all now playing and in, in, is engaged. So, um, so, so Ukraine is collapsing. Israel, uh, the Zionist uh, era is, is the beginning of the end of it. Now, um, what's also happening is the United Nations is becoming relevant again, which is a nice surprise. Um, there's a, so a lot of the good things are happening is that people are getting on the streets all over the planet about this, about Palestine, and it's real and it's and it's uh, pressuring governments to change uh it pressured the united states to actually try to this all now they're kind of going to netanyahu and say uh just just back it off a bit um you know just just don't uh, don't hit targets that are really military don't take out a thousand babies a day it's it doesn't look good you know we're 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 losing credibility israel is becoming a pariah and because we are what makes israel possible to do these things that are making it a pariah we are now becoming a pariah america so uh, uh tone it down a little bit and the the push to shove that's going to happen and i don't know if this government's got the capability because of all its neocons and stuff that we'd like to jump off to this and go to war with iran and wipe out Hezbollah, take down Syria, because they're on their list of, of kill list of regime changes where we destroy a country like Libya to save it. And um, so that that is, there's some people in the State Department that are just licking their chops, like, oh man, this is our last chance because now that Ukraine's going down, so that's another danger is that people are going, let's, Let's do as much mayhem as we can, get almost all our goals complete before Donald Trump becomes president and we're out of a job. Um, or Robert Kennedy Jr. becomes president and we're out of a job. Actually, if he becomes president, it'll even be more revolutionary. That's why I'm a little concerned about seeing what I saw in 1968 repeated firsthand. Um, I, when Mar I learned when Martin Luther King won all of his uh, legal battles, the only thing left is something criminal. You silence him violent, through violence. Same thing with Kennedy wanting to dismantle the CIA. If Robert becomes president, his uncle's assassination, all of that's going to be released. They won't be able to hide it anymore. So Kennedy was trying to actually start end the Cold War, which was making a lot of money. I mean, you know, it's odd, but uh, Oliver Stone's movie JFK was a great inspiration to me because uh, it, it helped me actually learn how to write about Nostradamus, where you have to blend myth with fact. If you understand all the dimensions that myth is, myth is one of the richest words. It can, for some people, it means flim-flam, fake, 
but if you really look at it it is it is it in its higher meanings it transcends fact and shares universal essence of a thing that's why people learn that's what was so wonderful in the lord of the rings the journey of frodo and sam to innocent don't know not clever people just innocent people who just understood in their hearts that because they were innocent who they were they were the only ones that could manage somehow in all the difficulties to get to the crack of doom and throw this evil ring into it and melt it and save the world so um there's there is there is a quality of myth you know the myth is is that i mean the, the things i take away from the great movie adaptation of tolkien's book which is also great i mean two things i um because i write scripts and understand the difficulties with movies um the i learned so much by watching the movies first and then reading tolkien so i wasn't dogmatized by my view how it should go and i realized i mean some of the things that well, I, I wish uh, Ridley Scott, one of my favorite directors, uh, had done this, but uh, he didn't have that epiphany trying to get into the rabbit hole that is a movie on Napoleon Bonaparte. Stanley Kubrick wanted to do it. I was, just, And I think he, he took years to prepare for it. I just saw a documentary where uh, the amount of detail that he did to really know the background of this. Ridley Scott decided, no, I'm just going to go with the images. I'm not going to know. I'm not going to read books or anything like that. I mean, it worked. It worked for a lot of his other movies. He's a master filmmaker, but um, this is a disaster movie that he made. And I mean, Joachim Phoenix is I'm one of my favorite actors, but he's not the, his Commodus outshone everybody else in that, in Gladiator. I mean, the whole, every time I watch Gladiator, as much as I love Russell Crowe's character and, and Connie Nielsen playing his uh, Commodus's sister, that is a performance of the centuries, the way he played it. But it doesn't work when you're in your 50s playing all the stages of Napoleon as a young man and all that. So, you know, you have the great statement that napoleon made it was beautiful how they did the whole um notre dame coronation it looks like it's a living version of david's painting of it which i saw in person when i was in the louvre in 1990 and 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 so that was a moment of genius but then poor napoleon opens his mouth and he said i found the crown of france in the dirt and all I needed to do was pick it up and put it on my head. <laughs> now, would you follow into gunfire a guy that charge? <laughs> <laughs> now, because I'm trying to get over the, 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 the disaster of that movie, this earlier today, after many years not watching it, because this movie is getting a lot of attention as a comparison of a good Napoleon movie is Waterloo with my, one of my favorite actors playing Napoleon, Rod Steiger. Now, what made, it was, um, it was um, Peter Jackson's wife who had the epiphany of the writing team with Peter and all. Where do we go with this Lord of the Rings? There's so many ways we could go, but they're all like a Gordian knot. They take us into a dead ends. And she suddenly said, we follow Frodo. And it was like, that's it. Just make it the whole, that string of the complex orchestral narrative. Make it the, the line of your story narrative. And it worked. So I learned so much from that because it, and, and so, so what, what did Rod Steiger do when he got the part from Dino De Laurentiis? He said, First thing I did is I, I started researching, especially what ailed Napoleon in 1815, because it's really a story of a, a great military general who's burned out. And so he learned all the things that, that was happening to his body, and it did influence the Battle of Waterloo. I mean, he had a raging in, uh, urine infection in the middle of that. I mean, that is a really uncomfortable thing to be standing there fighting a battle. And... Uh, 
he had prophetically stated that, you know, at Austerlitz, I realized that I, um, um, I've already had 10 major battles, you know, the, uh, it's so, such a stress to fight in war that I'm probably only good for another, for like a 50 of these battles of this kind. And um, Waterloo was, was 50. <laughs> he burned out, you know, and, um, but so you, so you follow in the, it was fortunately that movie was only about the hundred days. So that the, when Napoleon escaped from, from Elba and tried to seize France back, it's a funny thing. I write about it in my updates of Nostradamus, uh, his prophecies, because some of them allude to Napoleon a lot. Uh, I mean, Napoleon, I just also found out that uh, a lot of people looked at him, Napoleon, that rhymes with Apollon, the angel of the abyss, the demon of the abyss of Book of Revelation, Apollon. And I think Nostradamus foresaw that because Paul Ne Laurent is Napoleon Roy, uh, Roy R O Y is R O I in modern French. So Napoleon was his Corsican pronunciation of his name. You know, he spoke fluent Italian as well as French because he was half Italian from Italian gentry. And so, uh, so Napoleone, uh, Buonaparte, he, he Francophiled it into Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, so the, um, so anyway, uh, I thought that we needed a, to stray from the other themes and get to something else like Napoleon in movies. Um, I hear though that Stanley Kubrick's scripts and preparations have all been given over by his family to Steven Spielberg who is going to do a 10 part series based on Stanley Kubrick's work. Now, this isn't the first time that Stanley Kubrick's ideas uh, didn't end up being a remarkably good Steven Spielberg movie. AI was a Kubrick concept, but artificial intelligence, one of the best uh, futurist movies of, Q of Spielberg. And he and poor Steven Spielberg, everybody says, well, God, you kind of turned it. It looks like a Steven Spielberg movie. No, it's just the opposite. Um, uh, Kubrick said, look, I can see that what I'm not writing here is one of my movies. This sounds like something a Steven Spielberg would write. So you're Steven. I give you I'm not going to have time to do this one. So he gave it to him, said, if you want to run with this, because it's kind of. I'm kind of writing it like it's you. Go with it. So it's isn't it interesting because that was so well done. And now maybe what has been called the greatest movie never made, Kubrick's Napoleon. Maybe uh, now it's I think it's Amazon or something or Disney. They're going to let him do a ten part parter. I mean, you can't do Napoleon's life without it being at least 10, 20 hours. So. Well, Stephen's got the job, and I'm hopeful that uh, you want to see, you want to hear something that's you want to hear something that's really weird that you picked up, and I, I this is just <clears throat> for the ones that are watching. You know, none of this is scripted. This is all free flow. All spontaneous. None of, right. This is all spontaneous free flow. So you were you were talking about um, Lord of the Rings. Right. And Steven Jackson. And I've seen, I mean, I, I've watched the Lord of the Rings, the director's cut, yeah, you know, like, the, you know, and then the commentary, not yes. only did I watch the, All director's the commentary, cut, I, are so I watched, I watched the, I watched the, the, the release version, the original release version, the director's cut, and then the commentary. Yeah. You know, where they're doing, and I saw that for all three of the, of yeah, the, me the too. Movies. I did them all. Yeah. I learned. And so it's like, um, it's like 12 hours. It's like watching like each one of those, like 12 hours. So yeah. I've spent, yeah. uh, you know, about 36 hours of my life yeah. watching Lord of the Rings. Me too. <laughs> so, 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 so yeah. but remember when I was talking about that coronal mass ejection? Yeah. Was, yeah. Well, there are pictures on space.com that shows this, um, this dark, I'll call it a cavity. 
all right, on the sun, the surface of the sun, where mm -hmm. this coronal mm -hmm. ejection happened, mm -hmm. it looks like the eye of Sauron. Yeah. It, I, I'm not kidding. It looks like the eye of Sauron. So, there, so you're picking up on something that just happened yeah. with, with the sun. Yeah. Then we were talking about this. We were early in the show. We were talking about the Tanya. Right. And there are yes. these different ribbies that, that yes. came from the altar ribby. Well, the 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 um, the next ribby was was the 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 middle ribby is what is it's considered the middle ribby, right? Middle or ribby yes. is yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> middle mid, or ribby is the is the Yiddish, I believe. All okay. right. Now he he was around from 1773 to 1827. So Waterloo was 1815, I think. Yes, and also the so, birth of the United States uh, was 1776. So there's a little bit of that plutonium. Right, thing. right, 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 right. So the so the second ribby, right? So you had the 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 Tanya, the writer of the Tanya, that was it, 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 he worked on it for quite a while, but it was first published in 1796 all right mm. all right and then the middle ribby comes on board when he when the ultra ribby dies and uh during the middle ribby's time he was very again this is where the, the hasidic movement within chabad the uh, lubavitch they they were siding with russia mm. and not with with napoleon mm. while well, there were many jews that sided with napoleon mm. well yeah, this because, fraction just to interject jews. because napoleon abolished all the catholic ghettos um all the jews that were in jails and stuff he said no everybody's equal and this you know napoleon had a lot of revolutionary ideas in his in his change of europe and so basically he's the first major leader to make jewish people equal to any other europeans with equal rights mm -hmm. yeah right 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 and that this is part of the reason why there was a fraction that was going on during that time period which in in the jewish um russia had the soul and... russia has soul <laughs> that stuff in the right, west right, is good right. but it doesn't have soul right 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 so uh so there was a fraction that was taking place in the in in the jewish population in europe uh that were split and they went, you know, some went on the Russian side, some went with, with, uh, with, um, well, they, well, they went with Napoleon, the Orthodox, but... an Orthodox Christian country as Orthodox has Orthodoxy shares similar things, whether it's Jewish or Christian or, you know, that's probably why they, right. also... you know, I don't know if the Miller Ribby would have read Nostradamus. I don't know. Maybe he had, I don't know. But what he did say in his writings is that he viewed Napoleon as a butcher. And it's the Antichrist. It's, it, that's comes right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's Nostradamus's like, first Antichrist is Napoleon. Yeah, and the Miller Ribby was, was saying, beware this and, guy. This guy is not what he seems. No. And not only that, but uh, when he started to uh, arrest popes and doing that, it, it, he literally, in, when he invaded Spain, um, the whole Catholic priesthood was saying he is the Antichrist. And so a lot of people went to war in the guerrilla wars against the French because they felt they were fighting the forces of the Antichrist. And now I just heard about... Uh, the angel of the abyss and then how it rhymes, you know, and everybody thought he's Apollo. One. They, in Russia, they're saying he is Apollo. One. So, yeah. yeah. I just, I just find it fascinating just as we're free flowing. So the audience can see that there's, you know, there are these kind of cultural things that, that uh, themes that kind of weave into this larger historical arc that we're in, mm -hmm. you know, well, it's not just a ahead. movie. It's, it's all coming it's, to a head. I mean, in a way, it's not surprising that people suddenly have an interest in doing Napoleonic films because in a way, everybody's burned out on Hitler because Hitler is kind of just more pure evil. But I mean, I'm in an interesting thing with updating my book on the Antichrist prophecies of Nostradamus. I'm actually trying to help evolve my readers where I've been evolving with it and realizing the center Antichrist, Hister, 
uh, is pretty much, yeah, he's classic Darth Vader, Darth Sidious, evil. But there's a great... You know, well, I the, the, the thing that popped in my mind when you said that is, is that Hitler and Germany rep, rep, represented like a mechanized war. But when you're dealing with Napoleon, there's the horse. Yeah. There's a theme of the horse. And going back, and so... I personally think we're in um, a very tumultuous times that would be uh, how perhaps Christians uh, define it as like the four horsemen kind of situation where it's plague and famine and, you know, you know, death, destruction. Right. So, you know, there's something about the horse yeah. and the times well, that we're in. The horse is also representative of the 10th avatar, Kalki in the Hindus. We are in the Kali Yuga. We're going to start entering the Kali Yuga, the age of iron. And it's the the the, the four yugas of the great long periods of time. Now, the Hindus um, love to count bigger and bigger numbers. But I when I look at history as it flows, I mean the ten avatars is very interesting how they parallel ancient atavistic memory, even of before we were people. You know, the one of the avatars was a turtle. And that's reptiles, age of reptiles. The next avatar was a lion man, mammals. So those kalpas are much, those ages are much longer. You know, kalpas, kalpa would be the birth of the universe and when it retracts on itself, like in 30 billion years. So kalpa is much larger. But anyway, so, so. Then, then it became kind of godlike people like Rama, and then there's Krishna, and and then Buddha, who was foreseen by the Hindus, but they thought he would revolutionize Brahmaism, which means the Brahman class, you know, this the special high class Brahmas. Well, he did, but not the way they uh, projected. He basically revolutionized it by saying, if you're in your Buddha nature, you are all Brahman. No untouchables, no kshatriya warriors, no mercantile. You are one in Buddha nature, which is like being the Brahma. And that, oh, that really upset the Brahmins. And, and so they make it tricky now. They say, oh, well, Buddha was there to, te to I mean, the, the religions in the East are, are not as simple and direct as they are in the West. There's a lot of, there are a lot of nuance and subtlety. So they said, oh, well, he was there to test people. To just a fall, a willfully false uh, incarnation of God as an avatar. <laughs> so okay, that's that's gets a little too sophisticated for their own good. But uh, so what you'll notice when it becomes human people like Krishna is that you can see a parallel in time which is far shorter in reality. It's twenty five centuries. 2,500 years, which is called the wheel of Dharma. You know, the wheel is pushed by a great master like Buddha, and then it begins to spin, and entropy makes it slow down more and more until finally there's a time for another great teacher, a world teacher, to push the wheel and start spinning fresh again. And so, so the, so it comes down to 25 centuries. So the, we have finished the 25 century cycle because Buddha was around in 500 BC. Uh, year 2000 is roughly just like, so it converges with Joaquin de Fiore's very unusual heterodoxical theories of, of the 20 centuries of the father. That would be what Christians call the Old Testament. The 20 centuries of the son would be the New Testament of the Christians call it from their point of view, not as a Navahiman, you know. Uh, and and then the third is uh, the Holy Spirit. It's, so it's the Trinity. The names of the Trinity are three steps in the evolution of the good news on earth. And so the the Holy, uh, so the third is uh, where, which interesting that it converges with a lot of things that are going on, on in Kabbalah and mystical Christianity and others where God's access is immediate to your open heart that you don't have to go through a middleman and a lot of kabbalists and my contacts in jerusalem are really saying you know the, the, the it's something far more well like orthodox jews and and uh, torah jews which are totally dead set against zionism has totally gone off the 
off the track of the spiritual evolution of Judea, the mystery of Judaism. And, and they're being beaten all the time by the Zionists in Jerusalem. And they just very peaceful. There they are, you know, black hats and long locks and all and long beards like this. And, and they're just being very peaceful, just protesting. And, you know, these cops come in, the Zionist guys are just beating them up like brown shirts all over again, <laughs> you know, and, but they're Jews. <laughs> so, so it really, really shows in it actions rather than statements um, exactly what has been the concern of Torah Jews and early uh, Zionists who are not politicized um, that this it's like a bunch of polit political minded people um, who don't really believe in Yahweh um, they're, they're, they're not connected even to it. I mean, they're even openly saying in their quotes, uh, the most important, more important than God, more important than is the only thing that really exists, not God, not this, this, but the land, and that we control it and kick everybody out who's not ex exceptional like we are. And so I, in this unconscious statement, he's completely denying the, the religious center of Judaism, you know, the mother, the mother load religion of the western world as is you know hinduism and stuff is the eastern world i mean um so so the roots are getting exposed and i mean the the those who have gone astray from roots of truth and things is being exposed so it's um i'm i i mean i'm feeling uh, you know, I started feeling, I mean, last year it was difficult. I was thinking, you know, we might not make it. Uh, but now, oddly, as things are actually coming to a head and uh, on on face value can look more potentially dangerous, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid here, but um, I have this feeling that something changed in October but that doesn't mean a whole lot of afterbirth it doesn't have to get gooey and bloody and come vomiting out. <laughs> you know? Well, I think this is the, this is that dark cloud that I'm saying that it started on 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 December first and for mm -hmm. the whole world, and this is going to gain momentum and it's going to get darker, and that there's going to be these um, these tests. Yeah. And, but you know the thing is is that I think this is where there's a positive there there's a silver lining in the cloud oh, right oh yes right? it's a bigger play yeah. it's a bigger divine play and I mean I've been thinking about you and about what we talked about for the last two weeks and really watching yeah here it is but it didn't quite show itself off to what I expected I expected like oh World War three boom bam it's all done no no no, I, to, to, no this it's the way not. I no it's no not. this is gonna it's be a veil, this is, which is a birth and it's messy <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's and and the thing is, is that there are going to be these points in time. So there's like three things that are happening here, John. There's the sensitives that prepared themselves to be able to get some of this divine wisdom or divine understanding or knowledge through these influxes that are taking place through Kisla. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, you know, and we don't have that many days left of this. No. All right. And then it's lighting and it's lighting their internal menorah. All yeah. right. That will carry them on into this darkness mm -hmm. that is that is over the rest of the world. Now, for the ones that are not sensitive, the, the ones that are not sensitive on, on this and did not prepare themselves for light lighting of their own menorah, internal menorah, then what what will happen is, is that there will be these moments in time throughout this Hebrew year, which goes all the way into 2024. Yeah, uh, September. into September, right? So, and there are going to be points in time. I don't know those dates, mm. but I suspect that there will be about three or four really important points within this this arc year that we're talking about, where people could become better, and it's their choice. There's a there's a free will to be a better person, and if so, there'll be a blessing. But there's this, what I call the great disentanglement. Yeah. So it, there's this, there, there's, there's, there's an entanglement of good and evil, mm. right? And in people, right? And for a, for, 
for the or ain't self to come down and go through its symptom that I was telling you about and produce and shine something, either curse or blessing, it, it has to do this disentanglement. Mm-hmm. And there has to be there. And by disentangling, then you have the ones that should be blessed, blessed, and the ones that should be cursed, cursed. Now, the only way that I can explain what I'm saying is to use the the comparison of what happened during the Noah's flood. Hmm. Noah and his Hmm. family had to box themselves in in an ark, Hmm. right? And there's some dimensions and there's, you know, you know, you can get really Kabbalistic with this, right? With space and time, Mm. right? You know, and, and the, the religious dimension. So there, it's really five dimensional space. Mm. It's like a hypercube. Mm -hmm. So, and you're hiding in the hypercube, right? And outside of that hypercube is a world that's being judged while inside the hypercube there's there's protection there's a blessing so this disentanglement so another another case in point with the disentanglement was what happened with the paschal lamb sacrifice during passover yeah it was the jews that put the blood from the paschal lamb on the doorposts Mm -hmm. they closed the door they stayed indoors and their family was protected and their firstborn wasn't killed but Very well done in uh, in ben, in um, the movie Cecil B. DeMille. That was one of the best scenes in that movie when the when the misty plague came. In right. the, well, you know, the, it's in it's strange Egypt. that it's strange that you say that because this dark cloud that I was saying about December first, it's not like all of a sudden it's misty and it 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 gets darker and thicker, but it only gets darker and thicker. When the ones that have been disentangled, the ones that are going to be getting, that are assigned the curse, yeah. if they don't go through some sort of repentance. Which means so everyone... remember to become whole. And and also, um, the, the, the plague that beset Egypt, I would call it the plague of identity. It's like a mist. It, it has tendrils that unconsciously attach us to things that are only passing phenomenon in our hands, including our hands, these bodies, these minds, these that, uh, you know, it, and that light, uh, that Lux Eterna, that is coming in the more sensitive people is something that is beyond the horizontal world that goes from here to there, life to death, love to hate, courage to fear. And and so I'm 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 harking back to hearing the voices going, oh, in the background in the neighborhood of 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 Moses and his wife and every and then the mist is coming and, and it's like it's a little bit like Halloween in Egypt and but the, those those people that this is going like that and disappearing that was inspired another movie that I found really inspiring because it was the movie Russell Crowe playing Noah. I didn't Did you see ever that see that? No, I didn't see it. I didn't uh, see because it. you're talking the whole been inside the box and everything else. It's exactly like that in the movie. Really? Yeah. Because in the safer in the safer Yitzira, it, it has in its first. Uh, it's either the first. I think it's the first section or the second section, and it's talking about the um, in the first chapter. So it's like the first or second verse of the first chapter and you know and, it's, and it, you know it's talking about these five dimensions where it's mm-hmm. space time space time and soul I, I, you know I, and I, it, and it gets really weird it's like it, it even gets weird where it's letter okay. number so a letter you have a letter of the hebrew a hebrew alphabet you have yeah. a number right that of that letter mm-hmm. so that the that letter is space 
-hmm. It's defining space, right? You're carving it out, right? And then the number is the the Absolutely. time, the time, yeah. the time component. So now you have four dimensions, yes. and then you have the it forms a text that has meaning, yeah. Which is then the soul, the soul dimension. Yeah. So I just oh, yeah, I mean, I, he, he didn't go weird. into the nitty gritty of that, but the way the way the arc was, it really was like another world inside the flood of the forty days and nights and. Mm -hmm. And and the way it was built and the way that I, I don't remember who directed it, but he obviously in, imbibed into the basic Noah's Ark story, all the Jewish myths, a lot of Hasidic myths and things. I think when you, you're, you're, you're going to like, oh, wow, you know, it's like it literally somebody took all of that and made it work. It's it's and the world really looks like a pre Adamic even has that vibe about it i mean it's it's literally um ah, it's 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 one of the most amazing um kind of biblical movies that kind of added all the folklore mm -hmm. that's out of the of the main story of genesis it's a uh, the folklore that's from all different jewish people he gathered it all and put it and made it all work and god it was so wonderful well, I'll, uh, I'll try to maybe see it on uh, uh, Amazon Prime or something. Yeah, I love it. We I do a show where you, we have some feedback about it and we talk about it. I think Russell Crowe is remarkable in it. And the gal who played um, the the girl interest in in the in uh, Harry Potter, you know, the, the friend of Harry Potter who ended up with the redhead boy. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. one of the daughters of Moses and that that whole story arc with her she really showed her chops as an actress in that I mean she really got to show what a great actress she is and you know all grown up now but uh and that I won't, I won't give it away but it it really played to Russell Crowe's big burly big hearted guy to be Moses he was perfect for it it just and just like Commodus was brilliant as Joaquin Phoenix playing him, but you know, attack! <laughs> Napoleon, <laughs> no, no, and God, you know, it's a shame because you know I've seen the I, I, I've seen how the direct I haven't actually seen the director's cut yet of of Kingdom of Heaven it has a similar problem as Napoleon. He did he did a a public release that was. Uh, I mean, I loved it, but it had flaws, and it, it, a lot of people didn't get it and didn't think it was one of his best movies. Go see it, Ridley Scott's um, um, Kingdom of Heaven. You know, stars Legolas. He finally had his big starring role moment. He was very good at it. See that movie as a director's cut. It is one of his masterpieces that people don't know. Mm. Now, there's some hope that. Uh, a lot of the critics of Napoleon are saying, well, there's two hours missing. Maybe it'll be better. I um, don't think so. It'll just be two, more of two hours wasted, unfortunately. And that's hard for me to say for the man who did, um, you know, the prequel to Alien. You know, that, 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 that was remarkable science fiction. I mean, just absolutely out of the box. And also, one of the best Napoleon-themed movies ever written and directed was his first film, which won all kinds of awards, The Duelist. That's a masterpiece. That's what broke him through uh, he, in popularity. That's a fantastic movie. Um, it's about all during the entire era of 12 years of Napoleonic Wars. There's a higher class officer who's a hussar, and there's a a line Hazar, who's played by uh, um, the Kill Bill's younger brother, um, John Carradine, his younger brother. So now the only surviving brother from the father and stuff. Because uh, I saw John Carradine just before he died, and I, I almost met him. He was in the same bar. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, it was an amazing presence. I mean, in <laughs> tall, um, like his father was. It was also a great character actor, um, but. But anyway, the youngest one did that as the duelist, and it was um, and it was how this obsession, no matter how all through the wars, if there was a peace period, these two would have a duel, 
and never got I, anyway so it's an obsession thing i won't say more but uh, you know from my knowledge of the napoleonic eras and little details I'm, that's why i'm kind of surprised that he got that so right all the little details uh he, napoleon sinks or swims on the details and uh i i'm kind of shocked that he completely threw that out the window to his peril mm -hmm. because napoleon is a mess it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, you know, I kept on seeing news feeds saying that it wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't very good not to go see it. And, and I was well, thinking about seeing it, but well, I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of waiting for the, the four hour, see if it's a little better. I love the actress who's playing Josephine. Um, I, I kind of got into her in um, Fallout in the the um, Tom Cruise. Mission Impossible one that's called Fallout, where they had that incredible fight on two helicopters in the mountains. <laughs> well, she kind of shows up as the head of a, a mafia kind of family, and she's got all these brothers, and they're all kind of over testosterone and all that. And and she had this way of conveying her th thoughts and energy right into the right off the camera into you that that's really quite remarkable and one of the best lines is she's kind of has this fling with tom cruise almost and she's looking back at the family and all standing there like Ur. and she goes she looks at them she looks back at him kind of lovingly and goes family what can you do <laughs> it's like i said man this is this lady is great so i might i might definitely see it I'll commiserate with poor Joaquin Phoenix, who's one of my favorite actors, but not this one. But uh, she might she might attract me to watch the whole movie. <laughs> but there's a thing that happens is from what the what it sounds like is and what it looks like in the script and all this. She's there and then and then she's gone. It's like so what, you know? The whole story arc just kind of went. Now maybe maybe the the director's cut doesn't do that, but. But it's funny because I thought, why, why do that? I mean, why, why make a, a release that's going to turn everybody away from watching the film? I mean, that's that's what happened to Kingdom of Heaven. They, they, he, he, he crumbled to a lot of people saying, cut more and more of this to make it a certain length. And what happened is he cut out all the scenes that earn things. Um, and it, it's almost like he's in the same trap with Napoleon. He's everybody and because of the way the the reviewers are saying it, it's almost like yeah it's like well kind of like the the last movie of the of the prequels the anakin skywalker theory you know one time one time i was kind of watching a, a, a overview of the all of that trilogy and and because my own imagination i had concocted theme uh scenes to earn it to just see it, that movie was like one climax unearned after another until the final fight on the on the lava vault planet and all of that. But it's almost like I I one day I had a magical time where I I managed to in my own creativity put all the scenes that were missing like I'd already seen them before this thing came and then it was like wow and then it really worked. But I had to kind of pretend that all those things that she, as a storyteller i automatically do things like this and all those things that were unearned you know the, like how does it happen that that uh, his wife leaves him because he's gone dark you know that was just like one moment this way <laughs> that moment. Mm -hmm. and you know and then all the, the story arc of 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 obi-wan's love for his padawan his disciple and and all the ways that went down. I mean, I if I were to redo the whole thing with um, the the emperor and how he convinced Anakin, Anakin should have been Jesus Christ going dark. That he is the one to bring balance to the force. Um, that that he it's Jesus Christ listened to Satan in the wilderness. That would be how I'd play it. And all for all the right reasons, Anakin took upon himself to reform the Jedi's who were, I mean, he already, Lucas already kind of set that up. The, the Jedi were kind of rotting away. You know, they're too ancient and they were too political and, and he was a rebel. What if we went all the way with that? 
what I think the, the story would be, I mean, I have this funny, <laughs> I have this science fiction story called, oh, I won't tell the name because I mean, somebody might take it, but um, there's these elf-like humans. I mean, my whole idea is kind of take all the things that you usually um, just take for granted in science fiction and you say, no, it never happened. Light speed never happened. You know, <laughs> none of that happened. So, so what did happen is they all, they became immortal. So they could take the time to on sublight in some meteor somewhere to go out and find other planets and all that. And so it would be based on the um, on the um, one of Nostradamus's far distant future prophecies that is dated for the year thirty seven ninety seven. Uh, where the earth uh, so something happened to destroy the sun and the these two parts of humanity one went to Aquarius he says that he said they'll go to Aquarius for and be there for some time the others will go to the planets around the constellation of cancer and they will live time immemorial so my idea is that somehow after all these ages the the people that were uh, in Aquarius um are starting to approach the people in cancer but they are they're dark you know they're they're evil and uh and so so planets are starting to wink out in the solar system and they can't quite explain why so the man and wife were these elves who have a passion for 20th century 21st century science fiction a lot of the time when they have nothing else to do if they're not making love or if they're not dealing with other stuff you know, then and it takes years <laughs> before there's a lot of action and stuff because they're you know they're it's everything's as fast as going to Pluto was for uh, Voyager, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, um, but because they are just about immortal unless they're blown up or something like that, they they live forever almost, and they can re keep re replicating themselves and all that. So they don't have a problem with that, and they don't have a problem with long time. But they love to tell stories, and then I'd have these two arguing. The subplot is they'd be arguing about all the science fiction movies I love that kind of went off in the wrong direction. <laughs> you know, and like one one of them would be them remaking the Anakin Skywalker. Well, no, this is what I should have done. <laughs> so it's kind of comic, you know, some of my science fiction movies. It's a, it sounds kind of cool. Well, yeah, well. it's a, yeah, it's uh I have about eight eight of them. Um and because there's so much, there's so many sci-fi movies out there. I mean, it's an infinite amount of material to to revisit. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, why why did why do so many great time travel movies really contradict themselves in the way they time travel? You know, it's like now Millennium didn't. Um, that was that was actually quite good. In fact, the book is fantastic. That's uh, oh god, this guy who wrote Demon and the the trilogy and on the the moons of Saturn or something like that. I can't think of his name right now, but uh, one of my favorite authors, um, science fiction authors. Um, anyway, he uh, there's the movie Millennium where you know they they get on planes. These guys from the girls are dressed in stewardesses outfits and all, and they get on planes and they somehow manage to put everybody to sleep and replace them with with, with these kind of organic appearances of people called wimps, and they. <laughs> And because they know this this plane's going to crash, so so they make sure that they don't get the pilots yet. First, they get they put everybody to sleep in the compartment, including the stewardesses, and then they replace the stewardesses, and they they got their little ray guns and all that, and they and so they make them in such a way that when the plane burns up, it'll look like just human remains. Uh, but so they carry all the people off into the porthole. <laughs> And then they, but one, there was a mistake. Uh, one of the pilots goes to take a leak. He walks out and sees them and all the wimps. Uh, and it gets all messed up. And then uh, what happens is one of the people has to stay and be wimped out with everybody else. And and one of the, one of their things for the future ends up staying in that period of time. And then they have to go back and find it. Because it, if it doesn't stop, it'll cause a, it'll cause a a time wave that'll take a while to go through all the future and the past and uh, future and change everything and that's marvelous science fiction and um i can't think of his name right now very famous i mean there's probably people screaming well will be when this is broadcast it's him <laughs> it's his <laughs> 
So I apologize in advance. <laughs> well, we've been going for, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah, two hours and 10 minutes or so. So, you know, for the ones that are watching, the link for John's website is in the description of this video and all of the videos that I've done with John, especially this series. This is number four. Yeah. And uh, please click the link. It'll take you to his website and you can, you know, purchase his, his periodical, you, you know, his month that you have a bite. It's by, by the whole prophecy report. Yeah. yeah. Fully illustrated. You get it in an email as an attachment. So download, it's a great way. It's a slightly low tech, but it, it, it prevents me from being shadow banned and I can speak my first amendment, right. To you without some snooty something in Facebook land or Zuckerberg land saying, no, no, no. The Atlantic Council does not approve. We won't. We're all Raytheon and NATO and all that and retired CIA heads and all. So we sh should have a, a, an expertise on freedom of speech, shouldn't we? How to suppress it. <laughs> exactly. So, and also you do readings so they can yes. schedule for a reading. And uh, we're, you know, it's at the end of the year. It's probably best to get your reading. To figure well, out yeah, what's going actually, I put an APB out, and and uh, and now I'm starting. So yeah, this would be a good time to get a reading because people are starting to say, "Hey, I have a reading." So um, exactly, uh, um, lock down your reading by. <laughs> what will happen is that uh, you'll see and and down there you'll see a little ad and there's a little email you click on Hogue's readings and. And what all you need to do is put Hogue reading uh, in the subject line and I'll know immediately what it is. And I'll immediately get back as soon as I see it and uh, give you the overview and how, how to pay it on PayPal and, and all of that. And, and, you know, the fact that it has a astrology opening kind of, we're looking at the Kelly blue book of your birth uh, chart, which is your body, mind, vehicle strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, how you can drive as a soul, your car through life. I mean, uh, I mean, case in point, I'm literally hours away from being almost having almost exactly all of Bill Gates's astrology at birth, because we were born, I think, within a six hour period between each other on wow. October 29th, 1955. So how can wow. two people be so utterly different? Well, wow because of the soul driver uh and uh that's that's the key so you know a lot of people can technically understand astrology but the real gift is when you can feel the soul driver and it makes the whole difference in how one you know the astrology i had if it were somebody else's it, they wouldn't have survived to 20 years old <laughs> But uh, in my case, since this is a life of finishing things, um, it has been a blessing, this chart with no trines. <laughs> well, I mean, I recommend to get the reading. You know, I've had yeah, you've done, done it. He yeah, knows. Yeah, I've done it. yeah. So, I mean, you know, definitely the, the link is in the description of this video and all the videos that I've done with John. So please click the link and go to his website, sign up for the periodical purchase the books and do the readings it helps support John. So thank you for coming on to the show, John. Um, is there anything else that you want to add before we close it up? Nope. I think, nope. Uh, nope. I think we've, we travel a lot of different places today. <laughs> Suddenly right. dropped into movie land. <laughs> right. I was born in Hollywood, California. I can't help it. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you were born in California. Yeah, I was born in Holly in uh, in East Hollywood, the si Cedar Sinai. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, interesting. Okay, yeah. well, a goy from safe. Senior Sinai. A goy from <laughs> Senior Sinai. <laughs> so, so wave goodbye or say say goodbye to the to the audience before we stop the the recording. Goodbye, audience. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Let me stop the recording here. <laughs>